The following recording is a program of the World War I Historical Association. This special ongoing series commemorates the centennial of the First World War. This is Dana Lombardi for the World War I Historical Association. On October 2nd and 3rd of 2015, a collaboration symposium was held between the WW1HA and the League of World War I Aviation Historians. This series presents the seminars offered at that symposium. Uh, thanks everybody. I want to thank Ted and Steve and, and Sal for inviting me to participate with all of you today and for such a warm and gracious welcome. I asked uh, Sal a few minutes ago um, because I betray, uh, betrayed my secret that I'm a World War II historian and I'm not going to be run out of this room uh, at heart, but he said you're an eclectic mix of uh, war buffs, so that made me feel better. Um, as you can imagine, I mean, I'm typically uh, working with uh, 13 and 14 year olds uh, at the museum or working with groups of teachers, whether it's talking about the Holocaust, um, Armenia, Cambodia, Rwanda, Darfur. Um, so it's really great uh, to be in a different room um, with such a, a really passionate and an invested group. As I was pulling together the presentation for today, one of the things I began to realize in all my work that I do on um, genocides uh, with the, the exclusion of the Holocaust is that I think what's so unique about the Armenian genocide is that it's really one of the few genocides of the 20th and 21st centuries that we see the cover in shadow of war um, really used um, to fight another war um, against someone else. Yes, we can look at the Holocaust and argue that there were two wars, wars against the Jews um, and the war itself, but really the Armenian genocide um, was something that was perpetrated with the idea that World War I would allow the, the young Turks um, of the Ottoman Empire uh, an excuse um, to commit this genocide that they had been wanting to commit um, for decades. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Again, I'm not a World War I historian. Um, I'll do my best to, to incorporate that story and where um, uh, the, the Turks uh, sat. Um, within that story and the Armenian Genocide. So um, I had hoped uh, to show today two or three uh, very short clips of eyewitness testimonies of some survivors um, and eyewitnesses to the genocide. Um, but, you know, technology is great when it works and <laughs> when it doesn't. So I can tell you where you can find um, those testimonies. But uh, I want to end uh, the presentation today talking a little bit about uh, the denial of the genocide, which has now happened um, over these past 100 years. So we'll, we'll begin. I'll get my little quick clicker. Um, sir, I have the honor to report to the embassy about one of the severest measures ever taken by a government and one of the greatest tragedies in all of history. This was a letter um, written uh, by American consul Leslie Davis to the U.S. Ambassador to Constantinople at that time, Henry Morgenthau, in June of 1915. I think as the description of my presentation says that the genocide of the Armenians by the Turkish government during World War I was presented as one of the first modern genocides of the 20th century. Almost an entire nation of peoples was destroyed. The Armenian people were effectively eliminated from a homeland that they had inhabited for over 3,000 years. And this annihilation, um, as the title says, was premeditated and planned and to be carried out under the cover of war. Three key factors, I believe, shaped uh, the Armenian Genocide. One was the decline of the Ottoman Empire, which provoked desperation and humiliation among Turks and would-be revolutionary modernizers 
and eventually a violent reaction to the vulnerable position of Armenians within the Ottoman realm, and three, the outbreak of World War I, history's most cataclysmic war to that point, which confronted Turkey with the invasion from the west and from the Russians in the northeast. And we'll try to, as best as we can with the time we have, examine these uh, three factors briefly today. Yes, all right. <laughs> so just a little bit of a brief background about the Armenian peoples. Uh, they are an ancient people. They were Christianized in the uh, first millennium, and they're one of the first to develop a distinct national religious culture. The Turkish invasion of Armenia began as early as uh, the 11th century AD, and the last Armenian kingdom would fall three centuries later. Most territories were incorporated into the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. The Armenians were included, yes, in a multinational and multi-religious realm, but they were still Christian minorities to their Muslim rulers. And because they were Christian minorities and considered second-class citizens, they still had to endure uh, official discrimination, which meant second-class citizenship, including special taxes and admissibility of legal testimony and the prohibition of bearing arms. Despite um, these disabilities, most Armenians lived in relative peace during this time, as long as the Ottoman Empire was living at peace um, and was strong and, and expanding. And these two points, this idea of the empire being strong and expanding, will come back uh, to and become very important uh, later on um, in the precipitation of the genocide. But the final decades of the Ottoman Empire constituted an almost unbroken string of humiliations for its rulers and the Muslim population. Indeed, the empire had seen a decline since it was repulsed through their armies from the gates of Western Europe in 1688. The empire's administrative, fiscal, and military structure was crumbling under the weight of internal corruption and external challenges in the 18th and 19th centuries. And with that, of course, we saw an increasing rise of oppression and intolerance. The loss of Greece and effectively Egypt, and then eventually Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Cars, and Cyprus was crushing <coughs> to the Ottoman ego. These multiple blows to the Ottoman power and pride have been, I think, best captured by Turkish author um, that Sal referenced, uh, Taner Aksham, who wrote, the slow but continuous disintegration of the great empire, the military defeats and wars that continued over the year, the loss of tens of thousands of people, a society whose dignity was scorned along with the constant loss of self-worth, overwhelmed by the imagery of a great history, fantasies about recreating the past, the terminal bursting of these dreams, and the inability to absorb and integrate these numerous contradictions. The Armenians became a quick and convenient scapegoat for this decline, and the Ottomans would shift all responsibility and blame to them. This resulted in the Armenians very early on being targets of math, uh, mass ethnic killings in the latter part of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. An estimated 200,000 Armenians died between 1894 and 1896 in the Hamadim massacre, and another 20,000 in 1909 in Adena and surrounding regions. Additionally, you saw a flight and exile of thousands more, and the looting and burning or forced conversions to Islam of hundreds of thousands of uh, villagers. The perpetrators went largely unpunished, and as we know, this creates a great um, falsehood or feeling of impunity. So this fostered sense of impunity increased the likelihood of killings, and World War I would provide an opportunity for the Turks to carry this out. In the first few years of the 20th century, this outright collapse um, that we see coming uh, loomed large on the horizon. Here's a little uh, stat to, to think about what the empire is truly losing. Out of a total area of approximately 1,153,000 square miles, 
and a population of 24 million. By 1911, the Turks had lost about 424,000 square miles and 5 million people. And by 1930, uh, 1913, uh, you see I got World War II on me by 1930. Uh, and by 1913 was really holding on to a very narrow grasp of European territories. Um, by this point, they had lost over 70% of their population and over 85% of their territories in Europe. In the wake of these continued losses, Turkish nationalism grew among the Muslim population. In 1908, a young generation and extremist opposition group emerged, which was called the Committee of um, Union and Progress, or CUP, popularly referred to as the Young Turks. This new ruling triumvirate um, was led by the Minister of Internal Affairs, Khaled Pasha, the Minister of War, Emperor Pasha, um, and the Minister of the Navy, Jamal Pasha. There is no known, known photograph of Jamal, one that uh, is very hard um, to distinguish. He kind of stayed out of the, the spotlight. Um, but these three gentlemen quickly established uh, a de facto dictatorship um, after they overthrew in a military coup um, uh, Saul Hamid II, who was the ruler at that time. The goals of the Young Turks included restoring the military regime and the Ottoman Empire's expanse um, and glory. So I remember I, I mentioned that before. This becomes one of their driving goals. Um, to achieve this, they believed that they needed to modernize the country and to create a more homogeneous nation with far fewer non-Muslim minorities. Given that Armenians were located on both sides of the Ottoman-Russian border, the Ottoman Armenians were increasingly portrayed by the Young Turks as disloyal um, to the government. Reinforcing this view was the fact that in the 19th century, during these earlier massacres that I had talked about, the Armenians had appealed to foreign European governments for help and for intervention. Um, they called for democratic reforms and for equal rights. Um, were asked to be treated equal under the law as equal citizens uh, with, with the Muslim uh, majority. And the Young Turks saw this as disruptive uh, to their regime. They saw this as outside powers trying to involve themselves in internal affairs and intervene in um, their sovereignty. They thought that the Christians um, wanted to carve up the territories, get in bed with the foreign powers, um, and try to take over uh, the regime and position themselves for power. Um, and propaganda really portrayed um, this role quite well um, amongst the empire and portrayed the Armenians um, as a degenerate community, uh, bloodthirsty um, for power um, and, and working uh, to take over. Step by step, more radical measures were utilized by the Young Turks. This greatly accelerated with the increased concentration of state power following the 1908 revolution and was accentuated in the lead up to and during World War I. <clears throat> Turkish nationalism grew into a racial ideology, declaring that the Turks were a superior race and the Armenians were the reason for the decline. They were um, bacteria, um, they were worms. Uh, they were parasites. So some of the dehumanization language that we hear as well when we examine other genocides. And it became um, the trio of Ember, Jamal, and Talat that would oversee the Armenian genocide with a true and sheer zeal um, and would essentially be the ground layers um, and the organizers of this mass genocide. By 1914, as Turkey positioned itself to join Germany in the war, um, they became really embraced with this idea of pan-Turkism, this idea of a homogenous state, and became obsessed with um, who they viewed to be their mortal enemy, Russia. There was increasing tension between these assimilationist policies of the young Turks and the Armenians' continued hope 
uh, for reform, to be included within society. However, at the beginning of World War I, this would prove uh, fatal for Armenians and would set the course for their history. As the German forces were prevailing against Russia in Europe, a second front in Asia seemed to guarantee success for the Ottomans. Confident of their strength and witness to early victories in the German army, the young Turks chose to enter the war. Believing that the great conflict among imperial powers of Europe offered the Ottoman Empire an opportunity to regain a position of dominance. In the region, Minister of War Emperor Pasha and Minister of Internal Affairs Talat Pasha would sign a secret agreement with Berlin and in return for joining the war look to, as I keep saying, a creation of a new Turkish realm extending into Central Asia. The war placed the Armenians in an extremely precarious position. Tragically for them, their difficulties with the young Turk regime were compounded by the fact that this second front against Russia would be fought in the very lands of historical Armenia, where the bulk of the Armenian population lived. Straddled on both sides of the Russian-Turkish border, their homeland was essentially turned into a battlefield. Long chafing from the exploitation of their Muslim overlords, the Armenians had welcomed the Russians. After nearly a century of relative peace and prosperous existence under Russian administration, the prospect of falling under the rule of Ottomans was unthinkable for many of the Armenians living in Russia. While thousands of Armenian conscripts were serving on the Russian front in the war against Germany, many others volunteered to fight against the Ottomans. The fate of the Armenians was sealed between December 22, 1914 to January 17, 1915, with the defeat of the Ottomans to the Russians. A fatal war between two empires and their rival military alliance system was unleashed. In December, the Ottoman army commenced an ambitious and disastrous winter invasion of Russia, held the Caucasus region. The Russians not only stopped the Ottoman advance, but slowly merged into Ottoman territory. The failure of the campaign was principally the fault of Enver, uh, the Minister of War, who had taken personal command of the Eastern Front and chosen to fight a major battle in the dead of winter in rugged and snowbound terrain. With his ambitions dashed, this would-be conqueror exacted public blame um, against the Armenians for their loss and would soon exact what he felt was his vengeance against them. Instead of accepting responsibility for their ill-conceived invasion plans and the consequential defeat of their armies, the young Turks, as I said, placed blame on the Armenians by accusing them of collaboration with the enemy, charging the entire Armenian population with treason and sedition. They decided to kill the innocent for the actions of those who had chosen to put a stop to their planned conquest. Under the shadow and cover of war, with no obligation to uphold international agreements, and in an atmosphere of heightened tensions, the CUP found their justification and opportunity to resort to extreme measures. The Turkish state would be created internally. With the Armenians eradicated, one less racial group would be living in the Ottoman Empire one less disenchanted group to be tolerated. In a country of 20 million, the Armenians only constituted about 10% of the population. To them, it would be easy to get rid of the Armenians. In conversations with top officials um, at the German embassy in Constantinople, Talit Pasha stated, and I quote, that he wanted to take advantage of the world war to thoroughly get rid of its internal enemies, the indigenous Christians. And this becomes very important in some documents I'll show you later in the PowerPoint, when today we talk about the denial of the Armenian genocide. Um, one of the reasons largely being, oh, well, the Turkish took their casualties of war, they were enemies of the state, we were just defending ourselves. Um, or looking and deconstructing the definition of genocide, one has to have intent to commit, we never had intent, but there's plenty of statements and documents um, from Talat's own words to prove otherwise. 
The extreme nationalist ideology of the dominant CPU faction under Talat, Enver, and Jamal spread nationwide. As Turkey confronted twin emergencies at this time, an allied invasion of the Dardanelles Peninsula and a mobilization of the Russian forces on the northwest frontier. In April 2015, just as the Allies were about to mount their invasion, the Turkish army launched its first assault against the Armenians in the city of Van. The Armenians were depicted as traitorous supporters of the Russian army. In scenes that have become central to Armenian national identity, the Armenians of Van organized a desperate resistance that succeeded in fending off the Turkish attacks for weeks. <clears throat> Eventually, the resistance was crushed, but it proved as an excuse for the infliction of a full-scale genocide against the Armenians, with the stated justification of removing a population sympathetic to the Russian army, then battling the Ottomans in eastern Anatolia. As one young Turk, Bahadian Shakir, has said, as he wrote to a party delegate early in April. It is the duty of all of us to effect on the broadest lines the realization of the noble project of wiping out of existence the Armenians, who have for centuries been consulting and constituating a barrier to the empire's progress in civilization. On the evening of April 23rd into the 24th of 1915 in Constantinople and other major cities, hundreds of Armenian political, religious, educational, and intellectual leaders were arrested, deported into Anatolia, and would be put to death. This was followed by a coordinated assault on Armenians throughout most of the Armenian populated war zones. The opening phase of the genocide was focused specifically on males. The goal to strip the Armenian community of those who might mobilize to defend it. Though the Armenian territories, through the Armenian territories, males of battle age, not already in the Ottoman Empire, were conscripted. And U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau's account at that time said, the Armenians were stripped of all their arms and transformed into workmen. They were worked to death. In other cases, more directed measures were applied, and now became almost general practice to shoot them in cold blood, he said. By July 2015, some 200,000 Armenian men had been murdered by these methods, reducing the remaining community, again, as Morgenthau said, to a condition of near total helplessness, thus easy prey for destruction. The young Turks would now turn their attention to driving many Armenians out, not only from the war zones, but from the breadth and depth of the empire. The young Turks even created the temporary law of deportation and the temporary law of confiscation um, and expropriation. So I want to show you a couple slides, and if you can't read them, and I can get to them, we'll talk about it. So again, this is what there are so many documents. Two slides. I advanced two slides. I think so. Okay. I got excited. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Uh, okay. So again, before I was talking about, I mean, there's documents that Talat issues. I mean, almost foolishly um, to actually put this on on paper. Um, but you can see here um, official orders from Talat regarding the Armenian massacres. We have to remember the word genocide hadn't been created yet. So this is September 16th at the prefecture of Aleppo. Um, you've already been advised that the government by order of the Davajit has decided to destroy completely all the indicated persons, Armenians, living in Turkey. All who oppose the decision and command cannot remain on the official staff of the empire. Their existence must come to an end. However tragic the means may be and no regard must be paid to either age or sex or to conscientious scruples. There you go. This is December 1915, so after these massacres I just spoke about. Again, to the prefecture of Aleppo, Syria. 
We are informed that foreign officers are finding along the roads the corpses of the indicated persons, Armenians, and are photographing them. Have these corpses buried at once and do not allow them to be left near the roads. This order is recommended as very important. And I think these last two are the most horrific, I would say. So this is small, so I'll, I'll read again. So this is January of 1916, again to the government of Aleppo. We are informed that certain orphanages which have opened also omitted the children of the Armenians. Should this be done through ignorance of real purpose or because of contempt of it, the government will view the feeding of such children or any effort to prolong their lives as an act completely opposite to its purpose since it regards the survival of these children as detrimental. I recommend the orphanages not to receive such children, and no attempts are be to be made to establish special orphanages from, for them. This is undated, but um, we can assume through some research is shortly thereafter. Again, um, to the interior government of Aleppo, only those orphans who cannot remember the terrors to which their parents have been subjected must be collected and kept. Send the rest away with the caravans. So very easy for the children who can't remember to then be conscripted or adopted and converted quickly into Muslim families and converted um, to Islam. The others that remembered would be sent in these caravans, whether by wagon or by rail car, um, to concentration camps, um, as well into uh, the deserts like in Delzor, more than likely Delzor, Syria. Okay. During this time, the Armenians were told that they would be transferred to safe havens, this role of deception. We see that quite often in genocide. However, as Morgenthau wrote, the real purpose of the deportation was robbery and destruction. It really represented a new method of massacre. When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving a death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and in their conversations with me, they made no particular attempt to hide this fact. All Armenians in local towns gathered in the town center to be deported. In most towns, the local population looted and pillaged Armenian homes. The adult and teenage males were, as a pattern, swiftly separated from the groups and put on deportation caravans and killed outright under the direction of the Young Turks' agenda. Then the Armenians were transferred to what they called special organization units who led them on foot or by train to Deir or the desert um, in Syria, uh, where in the Holocaust, you know, the iconic symbol of the genocide is Auschwitz. Del Zor is that for the Armenians. Near Aleppo, Armenians were forced into concentration camps where they died from hunger or thirst during this march. Near Aleppo, Armenians received harsh treatment, were not given food, and lived in unsanitary conditions. Thousands of children and women were kidnapped and raped and were either converted to Islam or raised as Turks or were forced to be servants or sex slaves. <coughs> women and children were driven for months over mountains and deserts. Intestinally deprived of food and water, they fell by the thousands and hundreds of thousands along the routes to the desert. In this matter, the Armenian people were effectively eliminated from their homeland. Even the memory of the nation was intended for obliteration as churches and cultural monuments were desecrated and small children snatched from their parents were renamed and given out to be raised as non-Armenians and non-Christians. Henry Morgenthau did what he could and tried to really, he did, try to reason with the government, especially with Tilet Pasha, who he would meet quite frequently with, 
Um, and he noted in his memoirs that, in particular, his conversations were with Talat he found to be incredibly infuriating. Once the ambassador went to Talat Pasha's office and actually introduced eyewitness reports of the slaughters and what was happening, Talat sat back, why are you so interested in the Armenians anyway? You're a Jew. These people are Christians. What have you to complain of? Why can't you let us do with these Christian peoples as we please? Morgenthau replied, you don't seem to realize that I'm not here as a Jew, but as an American ambassador. I do not appeal to you in the name of any race or religion, but merely as a human being. Talat looked very confused by this response. We treat the Americans all right. I don't see why you should be complaining. Over 1 million Armenians, close to 1.5 million Armenians, and their traditional homeland was depopulated. A homogenous Turkish state of one people, one language, one religion was created by extermination of the original Armenian inhabitants. The defeat of the Ottoman Empire and its allies at the end of 1918 raised the possibility and the hope of punishing perpetrators. After the young Turk leaders had fled the country, the new prime minister admitted that some misdeeds had taken place. The Turkish military court court-martialed um, and tried and sentenced to death in absentia Ember Talat and others, but no attempt was made to carry out the sentence, and thousands of other perpetrators were neither tried nor ever removed from office. Within a few months, the judicial proceedings were suspended, and even accused, imprisoned war criminals were free and sent home. So one of the one of the clips um, I initially was going to show you um, was this gentleman. Um, Armin Wegener was known um, called known as the photographer. He was part of the German Red Cross at the time, and to great risk and loss of his own life, he smuggled a camera with him um, in his journeys uh, throughout the empire and would take clandestinely these photos of what was happening to the Armenian people. Um, thanks to him, um, depending on how one may look at it, but we now have photographic documented evidence of what happened to the Armenian people as well as the Greeks and Assyrians during this time. If it was not for Wegener, many of the most iconic images that we know of today um, from the genocide would, would not exist. Um, I don't know how many of you um, often go on YouTube, um, but the USC Show Visual History Foundation, which in the early 90s recorded over 52,000 testimonies of survivors of the Holocaust, has also um, began to expand their reach to testimonies of other genocide eyewitnesses. They have over 140 testimonies of Armenian eyewitnesses that you can go on YouTube and watch clips of. Armin um, Wegner, um, at the age of 95, um, gives his testimony and his thoughts about why what he did was so important to them, again, because he saw them as human beings um, and no different than him, and he felt an obligation and responsibility that he needed to document uh, for the future. And again, I was going to show two other slides of, of witnesses, um, again, you can watch these um, on YouTube. So I want to close, I want to talk about what we call the last stage of genocide. Um, we look at typically eight stages of genocide. The last stage of genocide you see in any genocide is that of denial. Um, and you see the role of denial actually during the genocide itself, um, as well as in the post-war years, and carry, has carried on unfortunately for 100 um, years. Uh, offline, if you ever want me to tell you about my conversations with the Consul General of Turkey in Chicago, I'll share that with you. <laughs> Those are fun. <laughs> um, Turkey to this day, as I said, has been um, really unwilling to face its own history and maintains a continual campaign of denial. Um, I can tell you that um, the Turkish lobbyist group in DC so that the United States never comes to a vote to recognize the Armenian Genocide, um, has spent close to $10 million um, 
paying off Congress people and representatives so that they will vote against a resolution of recognition, including Dennis Pastor. Remember that name for people who live in the state of Illinois? <laughs> a lot of things, unfortunately. <laughs> Long list. <laughs> Taking advantage of its strategic, geopolitical, and military importance, the Republic of Turkey has repeatedly oppressed on other governments, including the U.S., its opinion that remembering what they consider to be a complex but really no longer relevant past would be unproductive, disruptive, and unfriendly. Particularly for the U.S., we know, right, we use, um, we have a base there, we use them as a middle point to refuel. They always threaten to pull us out um, if we were to recognize the genocide. Uh, the genocide is now often referred to in the Turkish media as alleged or asserted. So what I want to do now is I want to play you, it's like a three or four minute clip um, from a PBS documentary. Can you all hear me in the back? I'm trying to use my teacher voice, yes? Um, a PBS documentary narrated by Juliana Margulies um, called The Armenian Genocide. Um, and I can't help but show you the idiocy um, of this blind following um, to denial. So we're, again, it's only a three to five minute clip, but it will give you a really good understanding of what's happening. Here. He works for the, the Turkish Museum um, in Istanbul, and uh, it's, it's quite interesting at the end. He says, yeah, you know, I mean, people always need something to cry over, <laughs> and, you know, this, this gives them something to cry over. We can show things on TV, people can get sad, they can cry about it, but people don't really understand the, the true history behind this, how... Um, what would have happened if we had allowed these, these enemies, these traitors, um, to take over the empire? And then they kind of do a man on the street um, interview uh, with three or four different men. It's actually illegal to mention the word genocide, um, specific to Armenia um, in Turkey. Um, and these three men saying, this is what I grew up with. It never happened. It wasn't a genocide. These were traitors to the state. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, I mean, it's really, really um, ingrained in, in society. So, what I want to say to that, um, and just overall, as we're as we're talking about this genocide um, happening um, under under World War, uh, the cover of World War One, is that I will say this um, to that statement and to, and to the deniers is that for all historical, political, and military reasons that may be cited to explain the young Turk policy of destroying the Armenians, it must be understood that ultimately the decision to commit genocide was taken consciously. Genocide is not explained by circumstance. Mass murder is an act deliberately conceived and planned. Decision makers can always exercise other options in dealing with serious conflicts. The real cause of genocide lies in the self-licensing of those in charge of government with irresponsibility toward human life and immorality and the conception of their social policies. Genocide is the fulfillment of absolute tyranny. In the new social order conceived by the young Turks, there was no room for the Armenians. They had become the excess population of which tyrants are prone to dispose. That's it. Thank you. Have a good time. Yes. What was the major cause of death? Was it uh, 
being shot or was it by starvation? Largely, so we asked what was the major cause of, of death. Largely, most um, was probably a even draw between being shot and being marched into the desert and, and starved along the way. Yeah. Please stand, please. During your presentation, you gave a site that YouTube uses for these test clips. Yes. Could you please repeat that slow enough where we can catch sure. it? Sure. Thank you. So it's USC, the actual letters, actually University of Southern California, Visual History Foundation, and then just type in Armenian Genocide, and they will come up. Yes. Yes, sir. What was being done to and by the Kurds during this time? Uh, well, you saw a, a mix. I mean, you saw many, many Kurds um, as well uh, that were killed. Uh, but they, too, faced um, some discrimination, some extermination, but certainly not to the extent um, of the Armenians, the Syrians, and, and Greeks of the, of the time. So, yes, sir, in the back. <coughs> Right, sure. Any relationship uh, between Ataturk and the Young Turks? Did Ataturk emanate from that group? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I saw somebody over here. Yes, sir. The Green Jack. Yeah, it, this sounds like a model for the German Holocaust of World War II. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. So we, so we said this seems like a model of the Holocaust. So two things we know um, prior to the invasion of Poland. We know Hitler, Hitler says, who after all remembers the annihilation of the Armenian peoples? Um, and you did see the, the use of um, the railway system, although we got to that much later in the Holocaust. There were also makeshift um, gas chambers that were used. Some of the caves that were in the desert, the Turks would light fires at the mouth and then um, would asphyxiate um, the Armenians by, um, by the smoke. So you saw um, some examples, I think, that were were set for Hitler, or Hitler looked um, to the Nazis looked to as a, as a template. Yes, sir. After the war, Turkey made a concerted effort to portray itself as secular, uh, and not just a multinational. Was part of that? Do you think, uh, like, a, trying to cover up, sort of take away one of the uh, reasons for their? Oh, but I mean, without a doubt. I mean, even. This year, uh, you know, similar as you all are celebrating 100 years, it's the centennial of the Armenian Genocide. Um, two years ago, President, President Erdogan, again, I don't know what um, these, these Turkish government officials are thinking, publicly made a statement that essentially said, I would like Armenians and minorities to leave Turkey. I don't want them here, they're trouble, et cetera, et cetera, they're an economic strain, whatnot. Um, and even, I mean, again, I mean, the amount of power, I mean, the amount of resources that they take to deny this thing, to, to cover it up, even for the centennial this year, um, Erdogan re recalled all of his um, consul generals, ambassadors, etc., cetera, uh, to um, Turkey to have a meeting to discuss how they were going to, at all costs, disrupt any Armenian commemorative um, program. And they certainly tried it at our museum last February. Yes. You mentioned that uh, this was a, uh, to some extent, a Christian genocide, right? Uh, and you mentioned uh, the Greek site, which had a sizable population, yes. especially in, in, uh, in uh, our south uh, west Turkey, right? mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ephesus and the coast and what have you. And the Syrians. The Syrians, Christians, yes. And, uh, what extent were they affected? You know, and why is it that the genocide referred to as a Christian genocide? Yes, okay. Um, so for, for the Assyrians, um, one and the same. I mean, they were uh, um, deported just as well, you know, well as the Greeks and the, the Armenians, um, you know, were gassed, were put in concentration camps, um, were conscripted um, at times very early on. So, I mean, the Pontian Greeks, the, the Armenians and the Assyrians really shared similar experiences. If you read the memoirs, um, you find a lot of parallels. There's not much um, difference in their in their stories. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do, and, and Chicago actually has the largest Assyrian population in the United States. Um, is 
when you talk to them, and it's become even more so as you move further away from this history, is they have all, in their own unique respective narrative, waited to be recognized for 100 years. And goddamn, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it with their own story, and no one else is going to share it with them. So, um, you know, we'll have a, events about the Armenian Genocide, we'll invite the Pontians and the Greeks, um, but the Armenians don't want to share the stage, or vice versa. Um, they've waited so long um, to be recognized, to have their history heard, they're reluctant to share the limelight in any way, unfortunately. Yeah, the gentleman in the blue jacket. Uh, this is a footnote, my wife is a Syrian. Yeah. And her relatives were murdered by the Turks. In the 1920s. Yes. Yes. Continued for about two or three years after you saw periodic killing. Um, after. Yes, in the back. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I I read that Jamal was not in favor. Jamal was not in favor of this this thing, and he was also in charge of Aleppo. And I think Salah was sending messages down there because they weren't cooperating very well. Mm -hmm. So what do you say about that? Jamal, Jamal was definitely more interested um, in the war and, and looking towards the war and winning the war. I mean, he was really more so than um, Talat and Enver uh, wanting to focus on the side of expanse of their empire, regaining you know the glory of the Ottoman Empire than he was in the, in the genocide. He almost viewed it as a nuisance, you know, an extra thing he had to do that he didn't want to have to worry about. So yes, and that's a very good observation that those those were sent as a reminder, like, hey Jamal, like this is something you also have to, to be aware of and be doing. Yes, ma'am. It sounds almost surprising to hear that there are still some Armenians in Turkey, but I was wondering uh, if there are any specific areas where the uh, Armenian population is located otherwise, mm -hmm. and if they're uh, how clannish they are. Yeah, uh, so there's a, a mixed diaspora. Many Armenians went to Iran. There's still a community in Iran. There's a significant community in France today. Um, here in the United States, they are in Detroit, and um, Boston is where they settled, and now huge population in California, Fresno um, area, yeah, yeah. The Chicagoland area has about 7,000 Armenians, and they're a very divided community by their church. Very divided community, yes. Yeah. I read where the, uh, at that time, what they called Syria, which is, which is all part of the Ottoman Empire, there were a lot of Zionists um, that had settled, and the uh, Ottomans weren't really giving them a very hard time, but, but no. they were taking a lot of the Armenians yes. that they found, you know, coming down mm -hmm. into, that, into the desert areas. And that was one of the reasons, because the Ottomans, I think, I'm asking your opinion, believed that the Americans were supporting the Zionists and therefore wanted to stay away from all Armenian questions altogether. Was that why Morgenthau was very interested? I, I think I think so. Yes, and um, it's a good observation. Um, an interesting uh, thought. Also, too, I mean the um, the Zionists that were taking in. I mean they they very much also became um, involved in the Near East relief and the movement um, for the orphaned children um, and providing humanitarian aid on the ground at the time and in, in, in Greece and Syria and others. Um, it, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting observation. I know Morgenthau, I mean, he, he left just essentially throwing his hands up because he couldn't get the United States government um, very early on to intervene. He, he left Turkey in complete, uh, yes ma'am, frustration. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, I can't think of awesome question and that actually um, makes me want to try to find the answer because I don't know. I've always heard more about um, the collective of um, the Near East Relief, um, the Red Cross workers who did all they could, um, again through secret and clandestinely so they wouldn't get kicked out of the country, to help as best as they could, to document, to help save, etc. 
Um, I would say I wish there was a heroine. That would be awesome. Um, and I'm, I am. I'm going to look into that, and I'll email Steve and the crew about that because um, I'm now intrigued. Um, but yeah, I think we all want the hope of like the power of one person that helps save. I think Armin Wegener, in his own way, um, was that in some respects. So um, yeah, I'm going to look that up. Yes, ma'am. Ah. My high school was 20% Armenian, and Albanian, Tomajian, Kasarjian, Castanian. I mean, yeah. my name even converted to Karadunian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I don't know about the uh, genocide, but my best friend, my old Kasarjian, her dad was one of the most calmest people, quiet, and one day there was a Day in Turkey, and he was or you know just through normal means of sponsorship etc I mean the Near East Relief helped a lot with that I mean the Near the Near East Relief um, we did a program at the museum in February about this the Near East Relief was the first ever philanthropic celebrity led the days before George Clooney um, celebrity led humanitarian effort they raised um, close to nowadays you know which would be 12 million, 15 million dollars, beautiful uh, posters, you know, feed the poor, starving Armenian children. Um, I don't remember his name, but I can tell you their celebrity person was it from Adam's family. He was their celebrity <laughs> voice. Yes. Uh, did the uh, young Turks misuse the Quran to justify? You know, that's so fascinating, such a good question. So there were members um, within the Muslim community that declared jihad on non-Christians. Um, and the Young Turks were not wanting to use that term to go that far. They felt it wasn't, um, to them at that point, it had become so racial, so much not a part, per se, of their religion, um, that they tried to avoid. Um, that term um, as much as, as they could. So yeah, that's a great question. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Stand, as far as uh, it being a religious uh, persecution, their treatment of the Muslim Kurds and to this day indicates this may have been more of an ethnic and linguistic cleansing than a religious one. I would say on multiple ends. So, um, and this is interesting, one of the programs we're looking to do in April at the museum is this idea of cultural genocide. Um, so you saw the genocide of the Armenians, which I think I referenced on multiple levels. Yes, religion was a part of it, but it became this, this racial, the, you know, the blood that, that goes through your veins makes you automatically the enemy. Um, but also this cultural genocide, they created an entire new alphabet post-genocide um, in Turkey was no longer um, connected any way to the Armenian language at all, uh, was in the Turkish language. You see in Turkey they renamed streets and buildings that had any trace of uh, a Chikian or Aradian, whatever it may be, to Turkish names. Um, you also saw the desecration of their churches, of their monasteries, etc. A complete eradication of any cultural connection that the Armenians um, were once once part of that, and you still even see that desecration today. Um, and as a museum, we've talked, we've been talking about the the interesting parallels between that and what we know has been happening in Palmyra um, today. So yes, yes, ma'am, in the back. You talk about the longest um, yeah. pro-church side. How about the other side? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Is there anybody speaking for the genocide in Washington? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, there is. Um, I mean, there's even, you know, I mean, the museum, I go um, and, and meet with people um, to, to lobby for recognition. You know, we, we just, we don't have the resources and the money that the Turkish government does. It's Turkish backed. I mean, it's Turkey backed. Uh, so the money's there, the resources are there, and they have, I mean, they have a smoking gun. I mean, they are holding a huge chip that will kick you out. You can't use our bases, our resources. I mean, that's what they say always. There was like a glimmer of hope. If you remember like five or six years ago, there was that Turkish-Israeli flotilla issue where we were like, okay, we can, let's try to get in here. Like Israel and Turkey are fighting. They don't really like each other. Um, they would say like, we're not gonna protect Israel anymore, et cetera. So we had a glimmer of hope, um, but I mean, they're quick, 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 quick. Uh, to, to sweep in. All the way in the back. <laughs> uh, is this is a PBS documentary, correct? Yes. They interviewed some Kurds who claimed they had kidnapped Armenian girls because they were non Muslim. So, that they kidnapped Armenian girls? Yes. Uh huh. So there was a correction, even though they're being a persecuted minority against another minority, all traditional countries. Mm hmm. Because, and I think he picks up the Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 I think with any genocide, any war, this idea of, of self-preservation, um, et cetera. But no, you're, you're correct. There was dual, yes. You mentioned the uh, Turkish advocates, lobbyists, tried to disrupt something at the mm -hmm. museum. Can you elaborate? You to share? Okay. Um, so about a month before the program we had at the museum, we got a call from the Consul General of Turkey. He said, it's an emergency. We have to call him right away. So our CEO called me and she's like, Kelly, did we do something? Like, what's going on? Um, so we go, we call him back. Uh, he knew I was in the room. He didn't want to talk to me. Uh, so, uh, you know, he said, you have to be sensitive to both sides. Um, he threatened us and said that he would make things very difficult for us um, if we moved forward with the program, uh, but wasn't specific on what that was. That was enough of a threat for us, um, you know, said that, um, you know, he would let the leaders of the Jewish community in Chicago um, know and make a big deal about this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so then when we got to the program, and we were aware, we've had a lot of Armenian um, awareness programs at the museum, have never really had any issues. This one, they came prepared. And there was about 10 of them in the audience um, we didn't know that they were there until um, about midway through the program. They spread themselves out within the audience. There were about 400 people there. Um, and they were young and old. Um, uh, anywhere from a teenager to like an 80 year old woman. Um, and midway through, we took a break between the program and one of the leaders, who I think was from uh, the consulate, confronted some Armenians um, in the audience. And we heard a lot of shouting. and. This old little Armenian woman, you know, with her babushka on, like yelling and pointing <laughs> at this man, um, and they kind of dispersed. But then when we got to the Q and A section, they began to stand up, and each of them had like a dossier, a book, so that when any of the panelists, which were some of the most renowned Armenian journalists and scholars, etc., in the world, um, and they were. Awesome and how they responded. I'm so glad they were there. Uh, but the, the panelists would respond with an answer, and you would literally see them being like, okay. So they said this, what's, what's my response now to that? Um, and I mean, they, they, you know, it was from historical questions and trying to get the scholars confused about the history to, you know, to now. Um, and you know, Turkey is a tolerant nation, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the panelists said, really, so tell me why your country has more journalists jailed than Iran, Iraq, and Syria combined. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, they just really, really kept going. And our moderator, you know, as, as Sal said today, um, but with the best intention here was a lot of statements. Where's your question? Where's your question? Where's your question? Making a lot of statements, trying to disrupt. 
Um, and Stephen Smith, who's actually head of the USC Shoah Foundation, who did this, at one point this man just would not let up. He wanted to stand up and disrupt and yell and yell and yell. Um, and he kept saying, I have one more question, I have one more question. And um, Stephen Smith, like, you know, took the microphone back from him and he said, you know, I began this program, I will end this program and sit down, sir. It was amazing and everybody like stood up and it was, it was wonderful and our security was there, but you know, we get calls, we get like, uh, I'll get a packet of books I have guys to read. Um, so yeah, they're, they're pretty relentless. They're, they're pretty relentless, yes. Yeah, and we once had the, the Consul General before this current one, the Consul General Yudlitz, he was well trained in the Beltway of DC, through the embassy. Um, he would send me letters um, and try to trip me up on the history or he would reprimand me um, as a Holocaust scholar. How can you say X, Y, and Z? Such and such happened in the Holocaust. I would write back. He would write me back. Um, it became this lovely little, you know, and so finally I just was like, you know, obviously let's agree to disagree. And the, the correspondence stopped. But there, you know, we don't we don't try. It's so fun, but we don't try to engage in denial. I mean, it's it's trying to rationalize with an insane person, and we try not to give them a platform. That's what they want. Um, so that's why, like during the February program, we, we as much as we could try to keep it contained. But they did. I mean, they they had a young person, and then they had this little like la like little eighty year old lady all the way in the back and. She started off like sounding so nice, and then she was like, "Way out with the right hook with like, this big denial question." So uh, they're good; they're very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, we're running out of time. Can I just say you did a brilliant job? Oh, thank you.